Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I heard you had a wonderful dinner last night. So welcome this morning. Uh, on behalf of Mark Murphy and the Green Bay Packers, my name is Gabrielle Dow, and I would like to welcome you to Lambeau Field today. I guess it's day three of your sport and society conference. Uh, you know, the Packers are really proud to, co to collaborate with uh, Tom Kunkel and St. Norbert on this, on, this, uh, on this conference. And I just was understanding, I mean, I, we were talking outside and there's a lot of different schools represented and, and uh, it's, 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 this is really neat. Um, we at the Packers take our role in, society, in, uh, in sports very seriously. And one of our key goals is providing exceptional fan experience. So we hope today that you kind of can feel what it's like to be a fan and, and, and experience Lambeau Field. So, and, and we hope today is no different than any other day. It is my pleasure this morning to introduce you to Dr. Kevin Quinn, who is leading this morning's panel discussion. Kevin has been with St. Norbert's College since 1994, a graduate of Loyola University. Kevin also has a PhD from UIC. Kevin was recently named the founding dean of the Schneider School of Business, which is where we connected. Through Kevin's guidance, I was fortunate enough to teach one of the MBA courses this past spring, and I can attest that this MBA program is headed in the right direction. But before I introduce Kevin, I have one bone to pick with him. Are you really a Bears fan? Uh, not, not here. <laughs> Apparently his office is just covered in Bears paraphernalia, and I tried to wrangle one of the students to go take a picture of it, but uh, that didn't work out too well. So anyway, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kevin Quinn, who will lead this morning's panel. Thank you for being here. Well, you know, anybody can be a Packers fan. Anybody can be a, a, a fan of a team that wins. You're a real fan if you're a fan of a team that doesn't. <laughs> um, good morning, everybody. This is the uh, academics and uh, athletics panel discussion. Um, I'm serving as moderator for a very impressive group of uh, experts. So um, I'd like to invite uh, the three of you to come up here. And while you're doing that, I'd just uh, give a quick little introduction. You can find more information in, uh, on their bios in the, uh, in the uh, program. So Anna DeForge is a Niagara, Wisconsin native, is a former University of Nebraska and WNBA star. She played in Europe for a number of years, 17 year long professional basketball career, and she's probably the best female basketball player to ever come out of this state. Uh, Darren Revell is uh, the country's leading sports uh, business analyst. He's with ESPN, but he has also been with, uh, with CNBC, and he might be the only person in this room that has an Emmy, but I'm not sure about that. <laughs> um, and finally, Aaron Taylor is a former Packers offensive lineman, a first round draft choice out of the University of Notre Dame. Uh, he is currently one of the top college football analysts, and he works for CBS Sports. And he might be one of a few people that has a Super Bowl ring, but there might be a few others in here. <laughs> so thank you all of you for joining us. So uh, I'm going to ask a few questions and uh, just uh, grab a seat next to you guys. So just uh, go ahead and, uh, and run with it. So let me start with Darren, okay? So Darren, can you give us a sense for the economic size of a big time college athletics program, you know, the sense of what the monies are, what the coaches make and that sort of thing. Um, and the other thing I want to ask you is, how do you figure out what the value is of a star athlete joining a basketball or football or any other kind of a team? So the budgets uh, we're looking at right now for the top college programs are anywhere from 140 to $175 million for, for this uh, upcoming for the 16-17 year um, and uh, it's it's amazing to see yesterday for example uh, UCLA s signed the largest uh, deal uh, for uh, shoe and apparel 250 million dollars you know they're going now t to 10 to 50 there used to be five-year deals shoe, shoe and apparel deals basically started around 1995 it was five-year deals five-year deals and now these the the TV contracts have gone, you know, 15 years, and now we're seeing the shoe and apparel deals go for 15 years. So, it's a, it's an enormous size. Obviously, the uh, the structures that these these guys are building, uh, the donations. Um, you know, you just look at the University of Oregon and Phil Knight and 
uh, the, the the locker room that they've built and the smoothie bar and barber shop that's in it. Um, it's uh, it, it, it's obviously uh, uh, like professional sports, um, uh, recruiting war and a and a, and a, a, a big battle for you know who can have the biggest. As far as the coaches, um, you know, at the at the top end college football coach right now, there's 20 guys that make more than four million dollars. There's 10 guys that make at least five million dollars. There's five guys that are in the six to seven million dollar range for college football coaches, and then basketball, it's a little bit lower. John Calipari makes seven million dollars a year, though part of that deal is he gets no bonuses. I guess like the Yankees. Uh, George Steinbrenner always thought, if I'm going to pay you the most, you're going to you're going to earn it anyway. You don't get any bonuses. Um, by the way, my favorite bonus Calipari used to have was the uh, graduation bonus, which is funny because he always had one senior walk-on who had a 4-0 in chemistry. <laughs> that was the quickest way to 50,000 I've ever seen. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so the college coaches are pretty much in the the, the top tier. Five to, to seven million dollars, and and then the last question is, um, how do you value a star athlete? You know, it's 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 very difficult. Obviously, right now, there's a lot of the college guys who, um, you know, think that they should be be paid. Um, it's hard to take one guy out, with the exception of because there's so many programs that people are rooting for because of the laundry. Yes, when they get better fine, but there are programs that people would show up to anyway. Um, so it's hard to value. The only thing that I've been able to do, and, and I can talk about this more, I don't want to take up so much time, but um, you know, the, the jersey sales, that's the one thing that really bothers me where you know, there's an athlete who has a, a number. The school has clearly given that number to Nike and Adidas and Under Armour. And then they sell it without the name and say, well, it could be anyone. And then something happens to that guy and the sales decrease. So it's hard to do uh, a, a good valuation on what a player is worth other than in the situation where you're kind of selling his or her jersey. Thanks. And uh, I'm, I'm going to ask first uh, uh, Aaron and then Anna. So at the University of Notre Dame, uh, I mean, that's a big, big money program, right? And as an athlete there, in what ways did you observe that there was this big money that was kind of washing into the university or the athletics program from where you were? That's a good question. Uh, when I initially got to Notre Dame in 1990, I believe it was the very first year of the NBC contract. So that was very unique back in the day and during that time to have a, a dedicated television rights program with a network to show your football game every week. That's now commonplace across the board. So I think that was probably the biggest indicator. Um, I think a, uh, an indirect indicator was the amount of pressure that I think we felt to win and to lose. I think as I got a little bit older, it was never discussed, but it was felt, the significance of it. Um, and I think as a player on campus, you're not aware necessarily of what you're doing because you're so hyper-focused on what you're doing more so than the revenue that it's generating. But again, I think the parallel is showing up on campus in 1990 at Notre Dame where they signed this huge deal with NBC. That was a news story, right? And that was pre-internet. So you learned about it, you read it in the newspaper, you heard about it. Now, everybody in the country knows what UCLA did with Under Armour. There's social media, so you're inundated with it. So I think the difference between my era and the current era is that players are hyper aware of the amount of dollars that are being generated on their behalf, whereas during my era, we were just happy to be there and be on scholarship. I remember getting my scholarship my freshman year, and, and the number of the value on it was on it, and it was $25,000 and change. And I was like, wow, that was like a year's salary for my mom, and they're giving me that to go play? Like, wow, it was unbelievable. And I'm, I'm unique in the sense that a big reason why I chose to go to Notre Dame was to graduate that that was going to cover my bases and at the time they graduated 97 percent of their players and i wasn't the best student in the world but i knew i wasn't three percent so there's a pretty good chance that <laughs> if i went to notre dame i somehow was going to walk out of there with a degree so 
Um, the economics were very different, but I think it's interesting, the parallel, because Notre Dame probably was the pinnacle at the time of revenue generation because of the TV dollars, and that probably had something to do indirectly or directly with where we're at now once people started realizing the economics of, of what can happen and what you can be generated from, you know, having the, the proper partner in television. Thank you. Um, Anna, you were at another big time football school, but you didn't play football, obviously. Um, tried. But you played a, a big time sport. <laughs> you tried you did try out for the team? Yeah, I did. Yeah, but the, Tom Osborne didn't, didn't think I could make it. <laughs> well, he, he didn't like receivers anyway that much. Yeah. So. Um, so you were close to another program that was a big time program. I'm guessing that when you got there, um, the women's basketball program at Nebraska probably wasn't a big time program, although when you left, I think it it mm -hmm. was generating a lot more dollars. So in what ways did you observe uh, the dollars that were washing into the athletic uh, program? How do you think that affected you? And how did it feel to see somebody else getting all of the attention, even though you were working just as hard as anybody else there? Well, I think the, the unique thing at the University of Nebraska is there's no professional team in the entire state. So all the academic and athletic support, all the money, goes to the University of Lincoln. And you see it on the, in, the, in the university, you see it in the facilities, you see it when they renovate things such as the locker room or um, the gyms. The, the, this is the type of thing where you can see how much money Nebraska is actually bringing in. Yeah, obviously, when you think of Nebraska, everybody thinks of the football team. The football team has has been outstanding since any of us can remember. They have 300 and some consecutive sellouts. There's just not, never an open seat or an open ticket. But I think in the money side of it, I don't ever thought, I didn't ever think while we were there that the women's program wasn't being shortchanged or maybe the gymnastics team was ever being shortchanged because I think they do a really good job of spreading the support out. Um, maybe the football stadium is the main attraction but um, they also have the most, you know, that's the sport that everybody wants to come watch. So you have to have all the seats for that. You know, recently they just put, they just built a brand new basketball stadium in the downtown area. And they have a new scientific research uh, division that they added that a lot of people in the country are trying to copy and imitate now. So I think at the University of Nebraska, like I said, just because there's no professional team there, the money that's generated just gets spread out pretty evenly throughout the entire university. This is a question for both Anna and, uh, and Aaron. Um, because you were a big time athlete, okay, that defined a lot of the experience that you had when you were in college. So in what ways do you think that your experience was the same as any other college student? And in what ways do you think that you, it was different? Um, I mean, do you feel like you missed out on anything or you felt like you got different kinds of advantages that maybe others didn't as a result of your status? Would you go in? Um, I don't think I really missed out on anything. I think what it did, it just brings more attention to you. If, if you're the best football player on the team, obviously you're gonna be easily recognized within the university or outside the university. I think it just depends on the person, how you handle this, how you are as a person. If, if this is something you like or if this is something you don't like, it depends on the person. I, I really didn't feel like it affected me one way or the other. I think we all like attention every now and again, or we like the accolades. We like to be recognized for what we do or how hard, how much effort we put into how we play or who we are. But um, I really don't think that I missed out on anything. And if anything, it, it helped me... Um, uh, see things in a different light. It's see my future a little differently. It helped me recognize that I wanted these things. I wanted to even get better, do, do more, and mean more to the university. When I put my uniform on, I wanted to be proud, and I wanted the people who supported the university to be proud. Yeah, this is a, a cost-benefit question, I guess. Um, I love it. We're, uh, <laughs> We're all pretty familiar with what the benefits are, free education and the notoriety. I call it the circumferential validation where you know, I got to be a meaningful part of, of a team that was so much more significant than myself at a, at a place that was bigger than myself. So it gave me meaning, it gave me purpose, it gave me identity, uh, it gave me a free education. The cost of that, I think, primarily for me compared to just a student versus a student athlete were the demands on our time. And 
I think that was most pronounced in the off season when there was no winter conditioning, there was no spring football, there was no practice, and you would go to your last class, get out at 1.30, and not know what to do. You would look around at the guys in your dorm, you're like, man, I can go take a nap? And, and I can get up and eat and then take another nap and then study? Like, it was the requirements, and now we have the 20-hour rule, which is comical. Um, it's a good intent, though, I'll tell you that. I'll, I'll give them credit for having the good intent of trying to manage the time. But the number one thing you ask student athletes about what it is they wished would be different would be the amount of demands on their time. The reality is some, of, some student athletes aren't qualified academically to be where they are to begin with. That's just a reality of it. It's not the greatest portion, but there is a portion of that. And those that probably could have gotten into college, you add on top of that literally a full-time job we're asked to compete in the classroom, especially at a place like Notre Dame, with people that have, you know, from 1.30 in the afternoon until midnight to, to have the opportunity to go to study, to do some research, to, to do those things. Where we're on the road, we're traveling, we're physically and mentally exhausted from working out and those sort of things. So those are some of the challenges. Um, Notre Dame was unique in the fact that they gave, we were allowed, we were forced and required our freshman year to integrate with the regular student population. There was no athletic dorms. We had to have a normal roommate at random. And I think I'm maybe not the best person to ask because that was an experience I'm very glad I got. After that, your, your sophomore, junior, and senior year, you could room with whoever you wanted, wherever you wanted, but you had to be on campus. We didn't have the ability to live off campus at that time. There was no Greek life. So you were, Notre Dame, I think, philosophically recognized the benefit of having us integrate into the population. And even with that, you were somewhat isolated, but it was much better and, and to a less degree than I think a lot of the guys that I would go on and play in the NFL with, what their experiences were. I, I've been to South Bend. You're better off on campus. <laughs> a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you live in Chicago and commute. <laughs> Yeah, uh, <laughs> Chicago's a nice place on the south side. <laughs> uh, <laughs> speaking of Chicago, Darren, you did your undergraduate experience at uh, Northwestern University, and while you, didn't, you were not an athlete there, you were involved with the athletics program. So from your perspective as uh, a student who was interested in athletics, um, what did having a big-time athletics program bring to your experience at Northwestern? Yeah, that, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I went to Northwestern. It was the best school I could get into with the best athletics. And what changed was uh, I was applying in the fall of, uh, sorry, the winter of 1996, so January 96, which is crazy because that was you know when they were playing in the Rose Bowl and my mother said, you better hope they don't win because if they win, you're never getting in. Um, <laughs> my mom's always been honest, so <laughs> nothing. They're there uh, to build yourself a. And they 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 lost they lost, but uh, I, I still contend I would have gotten in. So um, yeah, so so that was important to me to be able to uh, practice um, journalism, and I was the editor of the weekly paper and the sports director of the radio station. And by the way, I had no life either. Um, I went into Chicago on the weekends a total of seven times in four years at Northwestern because I was, uh, you know, getting ready for football games, traveling, and everything else. Um, so while it, while, it, while it was different, I had my career goals and knew what I had to do, and, and that probably took its toll on student life as well. But um, it was a great experience for me. I would say uh, uh, women broadcasting, Women's softball games and men's baseball games are the greatest, that's the greatest experience to a, a, a broadcaster, young broadcaster, filling dead air and knowing how to fill that space right. Um, just, in, just an incredible uh, teaching experience for me, learning experience. I did have something funny which I shared uh, last night, which was, uh, when we were down 21 in football, we had already determined that no one was listening to the radio station. So my friends folded up a piece of paper uh, and they wrote down words that couldn't possibly make it into a radio broadcast. Ten words and it was folded back. So I came to the game in my jacket pocket. I had ten words that I did not know 
uh, I would have to work in if we were down 21. So we were down 21 against Michigan, I pull it out, and I have to start the sentence and then look down. And so there's no one listening, because no one cares at this point, except my friends huddled around the radio station, <laughs> and they can't wait for the word to pop out. And, uh, and I remember one of the words was Calvin Coolidge, and you know, I was saying, oh, it appears is it, and, if, and it, obviously if you're not in on the joke, you're like, what the hell is this guy talking about? It appears as though Lloyd Carr is as content with his offense as America was in the presidency of Calvin Coolidge. And, the, and, the, uh, and my color guy is like a history major. He's like, yeah, I don't think America was too happy under Calvin Coolidge, so that doesn't work. You know, I'm just trying to get the words in, come on. So yeah, I, I, had, I had a lot of fun. Oh man. Um, Actually, this is for the, the two uh, athletes. Um, about how many hours a week did you have to devote uh, to practice, to team meetings, and uh, team-required activities that were not uh, part of the academics? Um, and how did you fit that in with classes? Can I go first? Um, I think it's different. It, they, the, the season is you have a preseason, you have your regular season, and you have a postseason. And then, of course, the summer is called your off season. But I think it's different in these type of seasons. In preseason, I mean, you're in the weight room, you're on the track, you're getting these type of workouts in. You can't necessarily always be on the court as a basketball player, so you're doing things like that. If you have injuries, obviously you're in the athletic training room getting healthy, so this is another time restraint for you as an athlete. Um, during season, it's, it's, you know, you're still in the weight room. You're still, you're, I don't know the amount of hours on the court, I think per week, I, I'm not sure what it is. When I played, I, I know we went over it easily um, because they also count the tape or the film session that you're watching. So maybe you're watching half a game or a quarter of a game, but then you're going out to have your regular practice for two hours. Then of course, after that, again, if you're injured, you have to, you have to go through the training room. You can't just leave the gym you must go through the training room. It's like cattle call. If, if you have an injury and you're not in there and you skip your treatment, now you're, you're probably gonna be doing some extra workouts on your own because you didn't sign in for your treatment. So now there's even more, um, uh, more demands on your time. And then in the postseason, same thing. You know, now you're recovering your body. You're still practicing basically back in the weight room. Your conditioning isn't as important, but they still want to work on some things. And um, you're just recovering, getting ready to improve in, in, in the summer months. And of course, in the summer, they want you to stick around. Um, I don't think that I ever came home once in my four year college career. I, they want you to stick around. They want you to run camps. They, want, they just want you there. They want their hands on you. So you, you know, they can utilize you for obviously the program and the university, but also to help you improve as a player. I think Anna did a really good job of kind of laying out the, the different seasons, if you will, because the, the time demands at different periods of the year uh, in football are very similar to, to what they are in basketball. And I think that's probably true for any sport. Uh, in season, a, on a practice day, a full day is probably five hours. You're looking at two and a half hours of actual practice time on the field, probably an hour and a half of film, and then you've got your, your weight room training and your treatment pre and post practice uh, around that, depending on what type of the year it was and how many bumps and bruises you had. But it was a, a, a legitimate five hour a day commitment uh, during the week. And then when you travel, it's, you know, you've got a three and a half hour to four hour window on a Saturday afternoon typically to play, but you've got to travel around that. So the, the travel home from the game, you're getting home, you know, at midnight and then you're tired. And then first thing on Sunday, you got to wake up and try and get all your work done for Monday and then go in and watch the film of the game you just played. And that's a three hour process. So it's, it's involved. And um, I'd say to, to put a number on it in season, probably 35 to 40 hours conservatively. Uh, spring football is, is not nearly as intense, I think. We would all drop a class in the fall and make up for it in the summer, but take a full load during the spring. So they're aware of the academic uh, demands on your time. Winter conditioning was the bulk of it right after the season, getting you ready for spring football. So that was probably two hours a day type of a deal. But in season is when it's toughest, and that's usually why most people drop classes and try and make those up in the summer. 
what kind of help did you have um, for, that the university provided to uh, make up for the fact that you couldn't spend the amount of time on your on your academics that other students would? What what sort of um, resources were available? At Notre Dame, we had tremendous resources. It, it it was a challenging academic school, and I think some places you get you find professors that are easy on you because you play football. Uh, at Notre Dame, there were there were most of the time it was neutral, but I think the 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 more common thing is, and I felt we <laughs> took this harder. one class. Yeah, it was harder. We took rocks for jocks, and when the teacher found out, we called it rocks for jocks. I think everybody got a C minus or a D. So <laughs> there was a uh, very much a, a standard that was held where the two sides of Notre Dame's campus have always kind of been in contention, and they didn't want it to be a football factory. They wanted it to be an a institution of higher learning. So the academic athletic sides always butted heads. So that part was challenging, but uh, the reality is you had to want to fail out of there to fail, that if you tried, you had the resources and the support services and the tutors to be able to provide you the support that you needed. And even with that, guys struggled at times, but you also had to be savvy enough to, to pick a track and pick teachers and talk to people about, you know, what's the best way to kind of navigate this thing and, and have some street sense about it, if you will. Um, but it's... And that was then. I think Notre Dame was probably on par with everybody else. The, the, uh, a rising tide raises all boats, and I think the life skills portion of, of colleges and, and the development of that to be able to help guys from a holistic standpoint has significantly increased. I think that's been reactionary um, and a little bit uh, designed to be able to help them recruit so that they can pitch the parents, but it's certainly a necessary piece that I'm happy to see start to come online because we're all going to be ex-athletes a hell of a lot longer than we're going to play. And I think the universities are starting to recognize that and are at the very beginnings of trying to create baskets of support services to help us once we leave campus as well. Yeah, same thing at the University of Nebraska, same, same thing along those lines. The, the support that you're given as an athlete is phenomenal. It's second to none. If, if you need help in classes, you have tutors available, you have advisors available, you have counselors available. They do a really good job of keeping you in line. Um, they, there's always a coach or somebody constantly watching your grades, making sure you're in attendance for classes. So they do a really good job of, of supporting you. And, and if you lack that discipline within, they do a really good job of instilling it within you to keep you in line. They don't, you know, the, the university, I, I know at our, our basketball program, we took a lot of pride in, the, in our GPA, in our team GPA, and I think every, every team had their set team GPA that they wanted to attain. And um, our coaches did a really good job of emphasizing that, as well as, you know, being able to be dedicated to excellence on the court as well. So uh, some of the things that you see at Nebraska are just the, uh, you know, the computer facility, or it's called the Hewitt Center there, where athletes could go, and it's actually just for athletes. They go there, that's where you can sign up for your tutors, that's where you can get your extra help, that's where you do your study hours that are required of you throughout the course of the week. So they have just a, a building that's just there for the athletes that, of course, along the lines of recruiting, helps some kids you know, make a decision because you see the support that they have academically. And I'll add this, I, I do some work with helping athletes transition from sport into the real world. And I, I recently worked with a student from LSU who went to the NFL, had a cup of coffee, and two years after being removed from the campus, uh, you know, came to us and was looking for some support. And as part of the intake process, we asked him, you know, you, he wanted to complete, do you have your degree? No, do you want to complete that? Yes, okay, what was your major? He didn't know. So that's the flip side of this story is some of these kids that are spending time on campus aren't there for an education at all, probably aren't qualified to be there. And there's been some discussion at some point about maybe there's two tracks collegiately, and, and I think this speaks to maybe the professionalization of an amateur sport, in air quotes, of having a vocational track that is a, a course of, of academic learning that is more suitable to the participant that instead of to, to not lowering the standard to meet their needs but being realistic about what their needs are. I, I haven't wrapped my head around that, but it's, it's an interesting thought only because on the back end I see 
where these kids are at, and, and some of them just aren't capable of, of you know, going to college and completing courses. They're just, they're, they're not wired that way. Um, and some of my favorite phrases, I mean, you told a, a good story there, but like we would joke around, you know, academically about Notre Dame, so we always had these rule of thumbs, and one of those was, <laughs> when in doubt, look about. Uh, a three by five will keep you alive. Better cheating than repeating. <laughs> if you can see, you got to be. So we, we joked about a lot of that stuff, but the reality is the pressures of competing in the classroom with students that have their full day at their, uh, at their will to be able to study proves to be difficult, I think, for athletes in general. Um, this is for all three, all three of you. Um, so all three of you had some uh, prominence on the campus, in the community, et cetera. When, either on the radio or as an athlete, how did you know that you had sort of arrived? In other words, when did you actually begin to understand that you were a celebrity of some sorts? Do you remember that moment? For, for me, it wasn't on campus, though um, I think the fact that the internet was kind of just coming alive, um, there was a co really cool moment for me, which I'll never forget. I was broadcasting uh, Northwestern UCSB women's basketball. And, um, you know, I was just doing my job and just broadcasting, making sure I knew all the players' names, trying to be the best I could be, and I saw it as a learning experience. And this was actually my sophomore year. <clears throat> and they had a player on their team named Aaron Busher, who was really good. And um, so uh, our team was pretty good. Um, and I finished the game, and I got home, and I had a message on my uh, machine. And it was Aaron Busher's dad. And uh, he just wanted to say he knew, he found us on the internet, he knew it was the only radio broadcast, and he thought I was a great broadcaster. And he listens to all the, and so it wasn't a moment of prominence, but it was a, it was a moment where it was bigger than me and me learning, and I thought that was a, that was a cool moment for me. So I don't, I don't think I achieved um, fame on the, on the campus, but I had moments like that where I think people on the campus didn't know what was happening. So I started a sports business radio show my junior year, and I learned that um, you know a lot of athletes didn't want to talk, but the the people in business did. And um, Ray Rhodes got fired from the Packers, and I called uh, Jesse Jackson. And I got, and Jesse Jackson was on the phone with me, and we talked about it. Um, it there was a ton of things that, that were going on that I would get agents and uh, team presidents and CEOs and couldn't believe how quickly I could get them. So it was just moments of prominence um, within myself, not, not people recognizing me. I think for me at the university, um, it, it was different because when I went in as a freshman, we were just not very good. We, I think maybe we won eight games the entire year and that was really difficult for me, always coming from a high school or a younger um, period in my life where we had won all the time and I hadn't really faced a lot of adversity with losing. And I think it took about two years where um, you started to see the change in the atmosphere and in the culture inside the arena, where maybe there was only 800 people in the seats my freshman year, my sophomore year, there was maybe five or 6,000. And this was a huge step. And I think one of, this is one of the things that I identify with where you knew that the program was in the right direction and you might be a small part of that because maybe you started to win or maybe people started to recognize you on and off the court. More kids, you know, start to want your attention and um, come to camps in the summer, these type of things. But after games, you know, you're constantly being, hey, can we take a picture? Can you have, we have your autograph? They just want to talk. They just, they just want to relate to you. And I would say it was about two years into, into my career where you just started to see more people come out to support and that's kind of when you knew everything was going to be okay. And by my senior year, we had 13 or 14,000 people at every game. So it kind of just full circle came all around in four years. And that was probably the biggest um, indicator for myself. Yeah, I think I knew right away, 
you know, going to Notre Dame with the TV contract, there was a lot of things that were unique about it and attractive. Um, I think probably if there were moments, there's probably two, and it was the first weekend my, my freshman year, and we played the University of Michigan at night in South Bend, so we had a pep rally. And, you know, kind of going through the, the, the normalcy of practice and the pregame talk, and, you know, Coach Holtz would always have us do this visualization uh, exercise in the indoor facility, and we'd all, of course, fall asleep, and he'd get mad at us. But... Um, <laughs> The, the pep rally and seeing our basketball arena filled, standing room only, and the cheering and, and, and the ritualization of it, everybody knowing the words to the fight song, and then the alma mater where we put our arms around each other. It's like I'm getting tingles right now talking about it, and I think that was the thing that drew me to sports the most was, again, being part of something greater than myself. I think I'm, I particularly am inherently team-oriented, and, and I gravitated towards that. And then, of course, the next night on Saturday, I remember run, I, I had worked my way up to a freshman is enough to at least dress for that first game. So I was proud about that. And I remember running out of the tunnel, and, and we practiced our pregame routine and looking over and like, oh, my God, there was Michigan. Like, they were right there. They were real people and players. And damn, that dude is big. And I mean, it was surreal and lights. At, I mean, a night game at Notre Dame Stadium, that was my first experience. And it was a back and forth game. And we finally win, you know, uh, a close game at the very end. And it didn't look like we were going to. And Coach Holtz comes in and says, see, man, if you believe that you've got a chance to win, you're going to win. <laughs> And that moment for me was significant and profound for a lot of reasons. It was, it's never over till it's over. That was one of, you know, my moments there. But it was being part of something greater. And then, of course, all the accolades on when you get back to class on Monday. Now the students, when you're wearing your Letterman jacket or, you know, we'd always wear what we called issue gear. So, we, you know, our indoor uh, cleats, you know, that had Irish on the side, you know, you'd walk around. <laughs> so, I mean, we were 17, 18 year old kids and there were like miniature ladies on campus, right? Like, <laughs> so we'd proudly wear our Notre Dame football stuff. Girl, what's up, what your name is? Um, but yeah, it, it, it was right out of the gate. And I, I think, so I'm an old head, contemporarily, you take that times a thousand yeah. with the proliferation of the internet and recruiting and these off-season camps, the Elite 11, all the media platforms. These kids come in so exposed and so gassed up, as I'd like to say, that they have such a false sense of reality. They get their butts kissed from the time they're 14 years old and their, their stuff doesn't stink, and then they get on campus, and the coaches tell me the hardest thing they have to do is de-recruit these kids so that they can work. They've never been challenged. They've never been through adversity. All the youth sports that they played, the coaches didn't, you know, weren't hard on them because they were the best, or they wanted their parents to keep paying the money. So it's created this dynamic of, of this culture of entitlement for these very talented kids that come through that the second they're faced with adversity, they don't know how to handle it. Or... Under Armour signs, you know, the biggest deal ever yesterday. And their quarterback, who probably is the most talented quarterback of even the ones that got drafted this season, the kid is unbelievably talented, ran his mouth about amateurism. Amateurism, huh, NCAA? And hashtagged a bunch of stuff out. So the, the, there's a saying, like, if you give somebody a rope, it doesn't make them a cowboy. I think there's a lot of cowboys <laughs> nowadays with these young kids because of the platforms and the exposure that they have and it's it's too heavy of a sword for them to wield and sometimes they cut themselves and others i, I want to get to the social media thing in a second but before we do i want to stick to the uh recruitment thing this is for all three of you um talk a little bit about your recruitment your own recruitment experience you know what was good what was bad why did you choose where you did um but also uh what you think is different now about recruiting than it was some years ago, and maybe some of the things that need to be changed about it. I know when I was recruited, the Nebraska, I mean, they rolled out the red carpet. They, they wowed me completely. I, I was even flown in on a private plane. Um, yeah. <laughs> Way I was like, wow, I get to fly with the pilot. They let me sit up there and everything. Wait, were you the number one recruit in the country? No, oh, okay. not even. So imagine. No. What about the suitcase of money, Anna? Where yeah. yeah. Anna, you had to be close to the number one recruiter. I think my parents have that. But no, um, yeah, they, they flew me in. Um, 
you know, of course you walk into these big arenas when you're used to just playing in small high school gyms and they have the jumbotrons going and they already have a highlight reel of you playing. And, um, you know, the, they take you to a football game, of course, the main attraction at Nebraska. They let you see that arena. They take you through all the um, – uh, just all the arenas, all the, the the campus, and you know, you just. For me, it was a gut feeling. I, I went with my intuition. It, it wasn't really all of that. I, that, of course, helped. But um, I, it was the feeling I got around the coaches. The coaches did a really good job of making me feel comfortable, feel at home, making me feel like I would have the biggest impact there. Um, make and then academics were important to me, also, not just not just growing as an athlete, but academics were very important to me. And, and I could tell that they had the support on that side of it as well. And they did a really good job of, you know, showing me both sides. Like, this is the support we get for games. This is the support you'll get in the classroom. And Nebraska just did the best job at that. Um, nowadays, I, I can't imagine what they do with some of these, these kids who they're trying to get to lure um, to go to their universities. I, I know for me it was pretty phenomenal. So to go above and beyond that, I, I'm not quite sure what they do. Um, and I do think the internet has changed the world. I, I'm t when I went to school, we still had the plug-in cell phones that you know came in the big old, they carried them in your hand and they plugged into your car lighter. So it really wasn't too much about the internet and social media back when I was in school, but I think that he plays, does play a huge part in recruitment as well nowadays. For me, it was uh, just the well-rounded nature of uh, what my education was going to be and the opportunity. The radio station was the largest student-run radio station in the country. Um, so it was that. Um, on my trip to visit Northwestern, I saw Meow, which is the improv group. Um, and two people that were in it were Seth Myers and uh, Peter Gross. Peter Gross is the... I think he now writes for Seth, but he was the head writer of Kimmel. And just so funny. I even remember what Seth Meyers did. Um, they played a game called Jeopardy, so the crowd would give the answer, and then they would do the what is. And the final Jeopardy question was, uh, the answer was, um, hold on, Bush Light was the answer. And uh, Seth Meyers said, who is Dan Quayle? <laughs> um, so just the, uh, just the fact that there was a student improv group and an a cappella group and 130 student shows a year and the academics and my athletics, uh, I was going to go there. So that was my... uh, For me, education, I think, was the most important thing. I looked at all Pac-10 schools back then or Notre Dame, and the only reason I ended up taking a trip to Notre Dame was because my athletic director, who's Tom Bowen, who's now Memphis's AD, was an alum there. And Tom was brainwashing me and putting keychains in my locker that played the fight song, and you got to go to Notre Dame, you got to go check out Notre Dame, you just got to go see it, just go see it. And I had no idea where it was. I thought it was in England somewhere, getting it confused with the church in France. I mean, I was all jacked up. I had no idea <laughs> where Notre Dame was or anything about it. But it ended up being my first trip. And on that trip, just something in my bones resonated with that place. I went to a Catholic all-boys school in, in California called De La Salle um, that they made a movie about. And there was a long winning streak. And it had a long, history-rich tradition. And the, the similarities between Notre Dame and De La Salle, I think, are, are kind of what sold it to me. And, and, you know, I walked into my meeting with Holt and Aaron Taylor, I want you to be one of the finest left tackles that ever played this game here. I see a captain in you by the time you leave here, son. Sign me up, coach. Sign me up. <laughs> um, so it was pretty simple from that standpoint. We got a lot of letters back then, and then there were phone calls, and there would be some in-home visits. But it is nothing like it is now. And I mean, we're simple creatures. I remember walking into the weight room and they had apples and bananas and oranges and this exceed sport drink. 
what? Now, the reason you had that was so that you could get instant energy to go lift weights so you could eat right before you lifted. What? I mean, it was state of the art. <laughs> and I remember going back and that was the, the point that I remembered the most of the entire trip and bragged to all my teammates about is that they cared enough about you that the training was so specific that you had a fruit bowl in the weight room, right? So the little things. Yeah, yeah, the little things. You compare that to now and, and what's happened with the, the arms race, it, it's almost comical, but um, you asked the question about what I would change. I think, again, the, 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 these kids are put in jeopardized positions, and it's hard on them, and it's hard on the coaches that are trying to keep up with them. So we have this, the proliferation of the satellite camps, which is you know, taking your whole staff and having these out of regions you know, camps so that you can recruit these kids. The, the on-campus camps that they have, they'll have 600 kids because there's three that they want to look at the deregulation of text messaging and social media. So now that a kid's sitting in class and is getting 20 text messages a day with these mock-up you know, draft cards and, and different things to be able to basically market to these kids. And the, the, the downside of that is that that's not in that kid's best interest. It's in the school's best interest. And I think at some point there needs to be a responsible look at a way for schools to be able to promote themselves, but do it in a way that's in the best interest of the kids. And it's getting so big, I think it's, it's cannibalizing itself a little bit and they're creating their own monster by what's happening with once the kids, if you know, you do all this stuff to get the girl to say yes, and then when you end up dancing with her, you realize maybe you, know, you weren't so lucky to get what you asked for. And that's what a lot of the coaches uh, share with me is that, that the problems of that. So. What I, I know is coming is a change to the recruiting calendar. What has been discussed, uh, and I was talking with Coach Alvarez about this yesterday, and these are philosophical changes, this next one, is whether or not to make freshmen ineligible again, to give them the time to acclimate on campus, to manage their time, to give them the one thing that they ask and they say that they struggle the most when they're surveyed, which is, I don't have enough time to do all the stuff that I need to do. Now, the coaches will never let that happen, but the administration is trying to look at that. But that's kind of where you have the competing interest, even on the campus, trying to find some happy medium. But at the end of the day, I think it's the kids that suffer from what's happened in the recruiting. And, and there are several things that could and should be done because of that. The fans won't have that either, nope. by the way. Number nope. one recruit comes in, nope. you're, not, you're not waiting. And I think it's interesting, your mom's perception early on. You, you better be lucky of Northwestern that they lose that game right. or you're not going to get in. If they win, the data of what happens when football teams are successful with the applications, it goes through the roof. If you're running a university and you're looking at the different aspects of your business, you're going to invest money on something that gives you the best ROI. That's the athletic program. So the athletic programs end up being a means to the end for the entire business, if you will. And I think sometimes the point of sport gets lost in that, and it's the kids that come through the campus, some of them that end up paying the biggest price. I have a couple of questions uh, left, but the first one I'm going to ask Darren and ask you to jump in. Um, for those of you that might not know, Darren is literally one of the great Twitter superstars out there. I mean, I, Whatever that's worth. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there's a way to calculate that worth, but uh, you have something close to uh, 1.5 million uh, people that follow him. I mean, I, can you imagine if you say something and one and a half million people are there? Somebody's not going to like what you say. Um, but these, I, I don't know if uh, kids, and these are kids, are 18, 19, 20 years old, have any idea about what it means to project information out. You talked about the guy at uh, UCLA. Um, how has social media changed the experience of the college athlete? I'll start with Darren and then I want to hear what the other it, it means that you don't need to have a camera or a journalist around you. You can basically put it out to the world and it's made it harder for the people who had controlled the message uh, to control it. Um, I, did, I, I think that a lot of the guys, even though it seems like, okay, you can see exactly the number of people that follow you, um, I don't think, you know, sometimes they have moments, I mean, they're 18 years old, 19 years old, there's moments of frustration, they don't get the idea of taking a breath and walking away. Um, 
And the one thing that, that, you know, since I am high on social media and I have made mistakes and I have suffered from those mistakes, so I want to say that, um, the idea that coaches don't let kids be on social media, I think, is really a horrible disservice. Yes, it's easier for them to say that because it makes their job easier. But, you know, Dawn Staley at... Uh, she's in South Carolina, and she she has a she can be on social media because it's important for recruiting, but her players can't. What does she What does she do with the with the the girl who's graduating with a marketing degree, and she comes into to the job interview, and uh, and you say, well, what have you done on social media? Well, I've kind of just looked around because I haven't been allowed to do that. I mean, social media is a part of life. It's an extension of what these kids are gonna face when they're not a professional athlete. And so the idea of saying, oh, you're gonna make a mistake, uh, so we can't have you on social media, to me, that's, that's really troubling because it's a part of life, it's an extension of life. Um, so instead of saying, like, they're, they're not saying, oh, don't, you're, you're gonna fail in your classes, so don't go to them. Now maybe some are saying that, but that's essentially what it's doing. So. I like the schools and I congratulate the schools who are at least having the kids sit down and talk to them about what the best practices are um, instead of just cutting it off. Kids are going to make mistakes, um, but yeah, just like in the classroom, you have to arm them with the best tools. I think it's kind of a double-edged sword nowadays because it's a way for kids to promote themselves or promote the university or, you know, maybe their family didn't get to see a game or didn't get to see a play or they have friends or fans, whatever it is. I think it's a way for an athlete to promote themselves. But I think on the flip side of that, also along these lines, if, if it can also be a big distraction for an athlete because maybe you you say something and somebody else you know it's 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 via text and sometimes text can be misconstrued or misinterpreted and now you're having to backtrack or you're having to um take back something that you might have said through pure emotion or something that you didn't mean that somebody took the wrong way and so i, I think it also it's a promotional thing but it also can be a distraction and i think that a lot of kids nowadays are just really really addicted it's it's an addicting factor to a lot of <clears throat> our youth and athletes and people who I mean, there's so many things. There's Facebook, there's Twitter, there's uh, Snapchat, there's, there's so many, I, I, I can't even keep up with them. But I think you have to, there has to be some sort of guidelines for, for people set. So, um, you know, they're, they're, they're getting, they're, they're in this world and this, it's helping them and it's helping the university, but it's also not hurting them and distracting them. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I, there's a lot that, uh, was said that, that I agree with. It's hard to police that. I, I, I come from a school of thought where the head coach was the spokesperson of the team. They're the face of the franchise on the collegiate level. I think what social media has done is given everybody a very loud megaphone. And with that, as a 17, 18 year old kid, sometimes you're going to say stuff that you regret or that isn't representative of the team or you misconstrue that. And there's a litany of examples that we have where you know, again, they wanted to be a cowboy and they had a, a two inch rope. Um, the flip side of that is the addiction part of it. The, the, the outside validation that comes in when you want to try and say something that's inflammatory to increase your viewership. You like the attention when it's positive, but what happens if you're the punter at Michigan and you mishandle the snap and you lose a game for your team that was easily winnable that was against your rival and you get death threats? So now fans have a ton more access. He got a positive phone call with the internet, you know, at the big, very beginning of the internet age, and somebody found him and had to leave a message on his voicemail. Now those 1.5 million followers, if they don't like something he says, and, and he takes a lot of flack as well for some of the things he says, you read it. And I know as a 43-year-old man, if I make a mistake in a game and I'm a, you know, a young analyst that's learning the deal, it's not always perfect. It's hard for me to sometimes hear and read. It affects people 
So to be 17 and navigate that with all of the passion around this sport, it's extremely difficult to navigate. So although it is a great tool, again, it's a cost benefit question. There are some benefits, but I think a thoughtful look at what the costs are, both when these kids prior to them arriving on campus and once they actually are on campus, and I think it's an education piece. It's not that don't use it, but if you realize this is what it looks like, this is what overuse looks like, you know, and how to be able to manage the realities that are negative that also come along with the very beneficial aspects of social media. Yeah, one rule is no tweet is a good tweet after 2 a.m. Hey, Amen. Nothing a- good <laughs> happens after 2 a.m. <laughs> That's why I've invented the tweetalizer. <laughs> <laughs> Simply blow into Put your the phone, phone away. <laughs> Um, okay, I, I have one last question, uh, and then we'll open it up to folks here. And um, it's probably the obvious one. Should college athletes get paid? And if so, how? And if not, why not? <laughs> uh, no, uh, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, they should be allowed to, and again, in the case of jersey sales, if they are overtly marketing a jersey, they should put your name on the back, and they should split royalty with the schools. So the, the top players should be getting roughly $1.50 to $2 per jersey, um, which would probably equal, for the top guys, fifteen to $25,000. Um, I do think players should also be able to market themselves. If you are in that small group, you should be able to do endorsement deals. Now, with that comes consequences, but these consequences exist anyway with recruiting and boosters, and that is if you sign an autograph deal, how do you know it's not with the top booster who's going to want 10,000 autographs at a ridiculously a ridiculous price that's above your market value. So he's essentially using that uh, to get you to sign with the school. Um, How do you know that someone's not gonna buy 10,000 jerseys? There's a lot of problems with it, but I think ideally, uh, I think that the top players should get disproportionately paid for jersey sales and be able to market themselves. There's no other way to really do it. Are you gonna, pay players based on performance. If it's a running back, how do you pay the offensive lineman for that? Um, It's very, very complicated, (laughs) I know, I know, because you know that would happen. So um, so I I think that's really uh, the best way to do it. I think the endorsement money is new money, um, and the, you know, the, the, the schools are not making that much money on licensing, actually. I mean, they're bringing in a total of six million dollars. The big schools, six to eight million dollars. But on the jerseys alone, it's much less. To to give a guy fifteen to twenty five thousand dollars is easily figured out. Um, so that's my that's my contribution. Um, I see it similarly and, and somewhat differently. I, I don't think that a segmentation of of compensating players that are the elite is a smart idea because now I think that would create problems within the team. We already have issues with I think I'm better than that guy and I should be playing anyway. If that happened, I think it would just blow that up and and, and be that on steroids, if you will. This notion of pay for play, that's a nice slogan, but I think the realities are a lot more complex like Darren just shared. Um, thoughtfully, and I think it's uh, uh, an issue is compensation, not payment. The issue of whether or not athletes should be compensated has already been determined. The compensation has been a scholarship, room, board, tuition, and books. The issue on the table, as I see it, is proportional participation in that compensation. When you look at the benefit of every stakeholder in big time collegiate athletics, and we'll use football as the example, they have seen exponential growth over the last 10 to 15 years in those revenues. We talked about the salaries that the coaches get. We talk about the budgets for the athletic programs. The pie is huge, but the sliver of the pie that the athlete themselves has gotten a chance to eat and consume has only increased directly proportional to what the tuition increases have been. 
So this notion of pay to play where you're giving a check for in return for your service like the players here in Green Bay do, like I did when I was here, is a false notion. The issue on the table is really about compensation and how to fairly do that so that the student athletes that have a direct result in the, the growth of that pie, that they are fairly compensated in proportion to the other entities that exist. So the good news is with the full cost of attendance that just came down the pipe, that's a step in the right direction about that. And that was where they figured out, each school gets to do this individually, and there's some creative accounting that's taken place already, but the cost of getting to and from home so Anna can go home in her four years while she's on campus is figured into that. The cost of living for the area, it's gonna be different at USC than it is in Auburn, Alabama. So it's a check anywhere from $2,500 to $5,000 that student athletes are getting on top of their scholarship checks and the other things for room and board that, that is a step in the right direction, if you will. What I would love to see happen in addition to that, because I think it's still out of proportion to a certain degree, is to have some sort of annuity program. And instead of having individual players benefit from their uh, opportunity and, and their abilities on the field, to maybe use what I remember being in the NFL model, which is a group licensing agreement so that all of the jersey sales for that team because Jerome Bettis, as good as he was, was benefiting from our block. So if we're selling a lot of number six jerseys, wouldn't it be great if we all got access to benefiting as a team because that promotes the team? And I think it's a whole different side story, but fantasy sports and all that, we're getting away from you know, the team concept and going to the individualized. And that's where I think Twitter with a, you know, individual players being the spokesperson for the team, it's all semi-related. But without clouding the issue, having an annuity program through a group licensing agreement that upon graduation you have either access to those funds or funds that could be applied to where you step on campus, you have the opportunity to return to get your degree at any point. Just up until two years ago, scholarships, I think it was two one, years. We have one year. Yeah, yeah. It, it was a one-year deal that was renewable, right? For the coaches, and, and a lot of people think that you sign a, a, a a scholarship, it's a four-year deal. It was a one-year deal. Now, that is changing, right? So that's a step in the right direction. But that was so that t schools could essentially cut players. So I didn't value my education at Notre Dame. I mean, on the front end, I did. I, I said that, but not nearly as much as pro sports. And what hurts us as athletes is we don't know what we don't know. So when I was retired and went back to grad school to get my multi-subject teaching credential, all of a sudden I was engaged. I appreciated my education. I was wanting to learn and it meant more to me at 32 than it did at 22. So I think it would be great if guys at 32, once with the benefit of hindsight, look back that there was an opportunity for them to go and get that degree that maybe at the time, because of the circumstances, they didn't have the, the wherewithal and the foresight or the appreciation of what it is they had. So I think the, to sum that up, it needs to be a collective effort that the collective group benefits in a way that's moderated either by conference or by individual university in a way that directly benefits that player in a way that's in his best interest. If we give them credit cards or just give them bigger checks, they're 22, they're gonna make bad decisions. But if you do something that helps them form the foundation of their life, that will be a deliverable on the slogan on the front end where this is a 40-year decision, not a four-year decision. Yeah, I mean, along the lines that they said, I, I, it's an amateur status. And I think the thing that I worry about or think about is, okay, if I was not the best player on the team, but I was on the team, I was a part of the team, and I, I was at practice every day, I was doing the same thing that the best player was doing, I don't know how you fairly compensate the, the, the superstar on the team versus the player who's still going through everything but is not getting the recognition. And I think this is the problem that would, you would create in the culture of the team. And now it's gonna affect maybe chemistry, outcome, winning percentage. I think this is a problem where, I mean, we're talking about young kids where jealousy is, is, is going to be an issue. And maybe now the relationships aren't what they aren't what they're supposed to be because so and so is making a little bit more money than I am, but I feel like I'm entitled to it because I'm doing the same thing as well. So 
I think it's a really tough issue. It's obviously a debatable issue. On the, on the flip side of that, student athletes are also restricted with the mo amount of money they can make throughout the course of a, a year. There's a, there's a cap on what an athlete can make versus a regular student. If a regular student, even a regular student has time to go out and get a job and make additional money. Now, with an athletic scholarship, okay, some of these things are taken care of, books, housing, you get a little left over in your scholarship check, but that max that you can make through, through the summer, actually when you have a little bit more free time to work, maybe that's something that, that people can take a look at for an athlete so they can have a little bit more wiggle room there to live off of. Thank you. Keith, we have a time for some questions from the... Okay, you're, you're the boss. <laughs> All right, um, we'll, we'll try this just so belt it out uh, and we won't need the mic. Yeah, go ahead. I like to think of myself as a student of history and uh, the discussion of diminishing returns always comes up and people always say, that's it, uh, this is gonna start to go downhill. Uh, sponsorship money is gonna dry up, this money is gonna dry up. Um, you know, there's, there's too much negativity, people are gonna walk away, fans are gonna walk away, this is a bad system, and then it never happens, you know? Uh, it's the same thing with ticket prices are too high, concessions are too high. People are just going to have enough and walk away, and they don't. People just deal with whatever life is, and for the most part, our, our days are so busy now that we don't even have any sort of like post-mortem on how our day went. And I think it's just a manifestation of, of life. Kids are exactly, you know, they're, they're as busy as as we are, when I think about my college experience, I'm so happy that I didn't have a cell phone um, for at least two years, I can remember. Um, because there's no, there's no, there's no disconnection. Um, but I think that's just gonna be a, a fact of life and there's nothing that we can do to, to change it. And I don't think, uh, I don't think diminishing returns are, it, <laughs> You, you can look back and say it's not what it was, but I think it's, it's really just uh, the new reality. Every, everything is a, a time spend and a time suck. Yeah, I, uh, it, it depends what you're measuring, right? If, if, if the return is revenue, it's not. That, that's a false notion. It's, it's continuing to grow. We are seeing participation at live events starting to diminish because we as consumers are getting our information, even the support of our fans through these. So that experience is changing. The millennials want their information through these, so they don't want to go sit at a game because they're bored. They want to interact and chat and tweet and get into Twitter battles with people during the game and those sort of things. <laughs> um, but the values of sport and what is provided for the individuals that participate that I think is in jeopardy. I think it is being attacked because of all the other things that are going on around it. So I still think it does pr provides opportunities to grow and to learn how to deal with adversity and to be a member of a team and to establish trust and accountability and commitment and all the things that sports provide. But it's all this other stuff as well. And, and the other noise, because the money is so big, I think at some point collegiate athletics is in jeopardy, and some would argue that it already has, of losing sight of what it initially set out to do, which was to be another medium to improve the on-campus experience and to develop young people to go out into the world. Now that's a very you know, feel-good, you know, touchy-feely, philosophical notion, but Notre Dame, as an example, has always had an intra-campus battle between being an, an academic 
institution of higher learning versus a football factory. Those two sides of the campus have always butted heads because in some ways they are inherently contradict uh, contradicting. No different with the NFL and with Teddy Roosevelt and what happened then and even you know what's going on with CTE and all the different things, all the different moving parts, I think, to his point, History shows us that you know bubbles expand, they contract, but the, the overall trend is up, and I think it may look different moving forward if your assumption is that it is the law of diminishing returns, but I don't think that this machine's gonna stop. There's too much at stake for too many people. I think it'll look different, and I think the measurables on the back end will be different, but I think it will continue on and continue to grow. Same thing along the lines, if you just look at tradition or history of of, I know Nebraska or Notre Dame or Northwestern, you, you wonder what the ceiling is or if it's ever, if uh, a pr the, the price to go to a game or um, park concessions, all these things that go into a family outing or if it's ever gonna hit a cap or just go the other way. But it, I think it has to do with tradition and what's going on. I, I, Nebraska's always been a rich tradition. Same thing with y your universities. I, it's about preference also. I think people, you put money where you want. This is, a, um, you know, the freedom of choice. And people are always gonna spend money the way they wanna spend money. And if it's on at colleges or at universities with supporting these things and as student athletes, then I think, you know, I, I just keep thinking about the tradition and, and, and winning and people always want to support winners or be a part of that in some, in some fashion. Yes. Well, I want to hit on the professional athlete track because I think that, you know, there's been a lot of so-called unintended consequences that come out once you start talking about being a professional athlete. For example, uh, you're going to pay me, so now I'm going to have to pay taxes on that. Um, also, my insurance that the school was paying for I am now going to have to pay the $80,000 premium for the $2 million. So w someone's going to, a, a lot of these kids are coming from inner city. Who's going to pay the upfront, oh, then, they, then, then the, you're paying them so they don't have their Pell Grant. So who's going to pay the upfront money to get that rolling? Because it's not just free money coming in. Um, and how are things going to be distributed? So. Um, I think that, you know, everyone says, oh, the NCAA is using our likeness, and now we're going to, uh, we're going to fight that, and uh, we're going to sue EA and the NCAA, and now all these kids are saying, what, you only got $500, and now I don't have my video game? I'd rather have my video game. So I would just say, we got to be careful what we ask for, and we have to go through and see exactly what is... Uh, what 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 are, what are you getting? Um, I know right now uh, the school paid for a premium, an insurance premium of a player who got hurt, and it was a loss of value policy, so he slipped in the NFL draft. And now there is a discussion as to whether he gets all that money tax free because he didn't pay for the premium, and that's just one of those examples where. It's so easy to say, oh, let's do this, this is the professional track, but if you actually don't work through things and talk about the real way it's done with taxes and 
and how it would work, I, I feel like if you do that, a lot of people would say, no, I'm out. I'm not, I'm not ready for that, that full, full idea either. So I, my contribution here is just to say that um, it's very easy to say, hey, this is an idea, the professional track. But I think 90% uh, of the parents and the kids of the high-profile guys would not be on board if you actually explained how it would really work. And I, <clears throat> I would agree with that. I think the, the bifurcated track where you've got the two where it's vocational, traditional education meets the needs of those kids. The, the third track would meet the need of such a small percentage and the revenue would be such, so diminished that I think the, the significant factor, the, the number one of all those that he laid out very well, is the fact that if I'm an employee, I can get fired. So where's that kid? And we've seen recruits that are five-star recruits that step on a campus that don't deliver. What happens to that kid? Is that in that kid's best interest? I would contend no. So the professionalism of this transitional period, which ends up being a free minor league for the NFL, incidentally, I think the, the best course of action is to truly serve the need of that kid who's going to be an ex-athlete a hell of a lot longer than he's ever gonna be able to play the game and to interject professionalism on the collegiate level does not accomplish that goal. Yeah, and on the female side, I mean, you're talking about, I mean, even on the male side, the amount of athletes that actually go to college, get athletic scholarships, participate as student athletes, the amount, you're talking about a small percentage who actually have the, the opportunity to turn pro, especially on the female side. There's, it's even smaller because there's just, the opportunity, I mean, there's a professional women's league, there's a professional soccer league. It, it's a small, small amount. So I think you have to have a balance. I, I don't think you can give a 17, 18 year old kid a, a track one or track two. You can't give them a choice. You have to look your education. You're going to need it a lot more in life than your than whatever sport it is that you excel at. And I, this is what Aaron's been touching on a lot. You're an athlete only for a short window of time, whether it's at that university or if you're fortunate enough to turn professional, the, the, that window is going to close. We can't play forever. I wish we could, but obviously we can't. And I think that universities have to continue to sell the acad academic side because your education becomes first and foremost the most important thing. Tom? I think, yeah, a little bit when you're in college, uh, just because of the demands put on you as an athlete. Uh, yeah, you do feel like you're an employee, but you also know that, I know that as a professional, it made it that much more fulfilling that I went through four years of college because it was a stepping stone for me. It, it helped me grow as a person. And I was, I got, I graduated, I got an education. I was put through a really good university and was able to grow as a person. Um, whether that be, you know, life skills. It, it taught me what I needed to know as a professional and to be able to excel and sustain my professional career. And without that four years, without that impact in my life, maybe I don't make it as long as I did. I played 17 years professionally and maybe without that stepping stone of the four years where I grew in college, where yes, I did feel like an employee sometimes, but I knew I was getting returns at the end you know, in the end, through education, through um, not having a student loan or a student debt, some of these things, but it, it just helped me as a professional later in life. 
it's interesting. There's a lot of parallels between being an athlete in a locker room and, and being a member of a two-person team, a broadcast team, and, and a group of guys. And the studio is like the locker room, but it's not the locker room. And I think that's kind of an overarching theme is, is the way I would see it. It felt like being an employee on campus when I was at Notre Dame. Certainly there were expectations. There was uh, an exchange of goods and services. I provided my ability to, to block the crap out of somebody and they gave me a scholarship for that. So it was a fair exchange. The difference out in the real world, I think, from you know, trying to define what a, an actual employee is, is most jobs, there's not an ability for you to lose your ability to do that job by doing your job, right? And if there is, then you have workers' compensation that compensates you for that. As an athlete, playing football can be the very thing that prevents me from being able to play football. So then what happens in those situations if you're an employee? Um, so those are some of the differences that I see. And I, I just think that the unionization, I think the intent was good, but Again, I, I think back to myself and, and my perspective on the world at 17 through 20 years old, it's quite a bit different than it is now. And I didn't know, I think the very thing that hurts athletes is we don't know what we don't know. So who runs the union? How do we know, how do you aggregate the best interests of, of you know, the walk-on, or not the walk-on kid, but the, the scholarship kid that comes you know, as an engineering major and the guy that wants to go pro in two years if he can, right? It's, I think the intent is good, and, and I would argue that the unionization of Northwestern, what spurned that was improving the outcomes and the experience and the participation in this pie that they've seen grown. That, and from that perspective, it ends up being a means to an end. I think there are more effective means to that same end, and we've talked about some of those here today. I, I just want to I just want to get in. Maybe there's some some a little bit more sensitivity here, but you know the Northwestern players didn't decide to unionize. The Ramogi Yuma, who has been for you know 13 years doing this, he came in to Northwestern, saw the opportunity, met with the freshmen first, to, you know, brainwashed them, took a vote, went met with the sophomores next, brainwashed them, took a vote, and he had enough people at the end of the day before he got to the juniors and seniors to have a vote on unionization. I think we have to be really careful when we talk about this, who wants what? Is it the players that want their, the likeness from their, the video games or is it the lawyers who took a 38% piece of the, the final pie? Um, you know, so the, the unionization guy, the guys come in and they, they get the players to say it's going to be you versus the NCAA. And then it comes out and it's, it's the players versus Northwestern, which they never even intended. Um, so I just would say that there's a lot of people who just say, well, it's the players who want this and this is why it's not fair. And I think sometimes we're not exactly clear who's running the ship or who's driving the, the car. And, and I'll add to that quickly, because I think this is an important topic is, and that was a very important distinction that, that Darren drew there. And I think the, a similar thing happened on the campus in Missouri, when there was a student who wasn't an athlete, but was friends with athletes. The athletes came to the aid, and it became a national story because of the involvement of football players on that campus. Had it just been the student, it probably would have been a fart in the wind. So sometimes I think the ability of students to speak their voice and campuses and universities across the country have always been the the ground zero of change if you will in the 60s and civil rights and and you know the the examples are are countless about where change has been affected on campuses by students and people belonging to that you know raising their voice but i think to darren's point again athletes I think 17 to 20 year olds aren't thoughtful enough as a group to always know what's in their best interest. And because of that, I think the universities are positioned the best to still find whatever that happy medium is to be able to provide them better outcomes where they get to participate more in this exponential growth in a way that will truly serve the student athlete versus outside influences that are whispering in your ear saying, man, you know what you should do, right? We have time for one more, and you're the lucky one. Yeah. 
Um, flamethrowers. <laughs> That's a big thing in Europe. I don't know how they get them in the gyms, but... Um, no, that's during, they'll just light them off during the game. It's crazy that the <laughs> European fans, I will tell you, and this isn't to say this isn't in America, they are passionate. And when I say passionate, it's, it's this type of action. Sometimes you will even see fights in the stands. Maybe you have a, a Fenerbahce in Turkey versus a Galatasaray. And these are two huge programs or huge entities, clubs that they hate each other. They, they're in the same city, in the same country, and they hate each other. And they will get in fights in the stands. So I would definitely not want this to carry over into the U.S. I mean, you can always, you can love your team, support your team, but you definitely don't want this type of thing. It's, it's really tragic when you see fans or hear about fans getting beaten up or abused and, and dying sometimes after games. Um, but I, I would, one thing that's... It's just, it's definitely the passion. Uh, there, the the venues are a lot smaller. It's sometimes you can only seat two thousand people. So when it's when there's two thousand people in there, it's loud. It's you know the passion. You can feel the energy. It's what every athlete dreams of. Because sometimes when you're a little bit fatigued in a game or you feel yourself slipping, now the energy of the of the fans pulls you through and pushes you through. And this happens here also. I think the men, they don't have to worry about this as much as the females because their, their arenas are already always sold out. With us, it's not always the case. You don't know how many people are going to be there. This is something that the men never have to worry about. They know when they put their uniform on, they run out, there's going to be 50, 60, 70, 80,000 people out there screaming for three hours if it's a football game. On the female side, you just don't know that. Sometimes you wonder, okay, well, are there going to be 500 people here today or are there going to be 15,000? So um, I, I think, you know, just with the European experience, it's the passion that, that these fans, and I mean, you can literally live 10 minutes from each other and there's a lot of passion there. Thank you very much. I want to personally thank all three of our panelists. Um, I had an opportunity to spend a fair amount of time with each of them yesterday, and uh, they have so very generously given up their time to be here. Um, it was an honor to work with all three of you, so please, let's recognize their work there. Thank you. I'd, I'd also like to, before I bring Keith back up here, I'd also like to uh, recognize all the effort that Keith and Karen and Mike Counter have put into this, and also what uh, Tom Kunkel and Mark Murphy have done to make this uh, make this what it's turned out to be. Thank you, folks. I too would like to, to thank the panelists for sharing their insights and experiences with us today, and also Kevin Quinn for the provocative line of questioning that uh, led us forward through this uh, through this panel. We are now going to take a break, short break, and reconvene in this room at 11.15 for the keynote address by uh, Jeffrey Kessler. So see you back here in just a few moments. Thank you. <laughs>